Robert Edward Lee, commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia. In May of 1862, I was recalled from the Carolinas in Florida, where I was serving as chief engineer and advisor to the president to shore up our very valuable seaports of Savannah, Charleston, St. Augustine. I returned back to Richmond to find that General Johnston is falling back towards the city, being pursued by this massive army of General McClellan's. And if you climbed up into the church towers and looked out, you could see the Federal Army within five miles of the city, all across the horizon. Well, I sent a letter to General Johnston that I am back. And if he needs any assistance, all he needs to do is let me know what he wants me to do. I am not here to take charge only to lend a helping hand wherever I can. Well, I heard no word back from him. The Battle of Seven Pines was to begin on the 29th of May, but General Huger wasn't ready, so they postponed it till the 30th of May. That morning, curiosity got the better part of me, and I decided to ride out to the battle lines to see what was happening. And I ended up running into President Davis, who also wasn't hearing anything back from General Johnston, and as we were stand, sitting on our horses conversing, General Johnson rides up and gives us brief salutations and is off to the sound of the guns. Within a short period of time, when we receive word that General Johnson has been very seriously wounded, quite possibly mortally. And as we turned our horses around and began our ride back into Richmond, President Davis looked over at me and he said, General Lee, the Army is now yours. This was the opportunity I've been waiting for. Now is the time that my star is going to rise and I am going to show the southern newspapers and the southern population what kind of a general that I am. I have a different philosophy of war than General Johnson. I believe in attack, attack, attack. Never hold anything back. Never fight for the same land twice, especially Virginia land. I would take the next three weeks of drilling my army as we were receiving reinforcements every night from the deep south and I would decide on what generals that would serve under me. Generals like General Huger and General Magruder, they would no longer find a place in this army as it was reported they were drinking during the Battle of Seven Pines. General Longstreet had proven himself. General A.P. Hill had proven himself and I had ordered General General Jackson up from the valley. This would be the first time that the two armies would be almost of equal strength. General McClellan's army was about 110,000, we were at 95,000. On the 1st of June, I would change the name of the army, which was known as the Army of the Potomac, same as our adversaries, but I would change it to the Army of Northern Virginia. This was to give our boys their own sense of identity so that when they achieved something, people would know who won the battle. We would, we would attack General McClellan's army that would become known as the Seven Days Battles. Now, how it ever got the name of Seven Days Battles, I have no idea because there was only five battles over six days. But then again, the newspapers never seem to get anything right. <laughs> General Jackson was to attack early in the morning from behind General McClellan's lines. And when he engaged, and General A.P. Hill, who had our largest division, was then to engage in the front. But nothing happened. General Hill waited for five hours, and no word from General Jackson. He got nervous, and he decided he was going to attack. The first battle would be called the Battle of Mechanicsville. He would attack and he would suffer very heavy casualties, nearly 5,000 casualties that day. Turns out General Jackson's army was too exhausted from their march from the valley to go into battle that day. But we would next meet them at Gaines's Mill. This would be the largest of the five battles and we would throw everything we had at them. And we would push the Federal Army but we still hadn't pushed him off the peninsula, which was our objective. We would next meet him at Savage Station. 
Then we'd meet him at Fraser's Farm. Then finally we'd meet him at Malvern Hill. Now General McClellan had pulled his army up this massive hill where he had protection from the Union gunboats on the James River. And he massed his artillery and his infantry at the top of that hill. And the only way that we could get at him is to go up after him. Now our attacks were not coordinated. And we suffered very heavy casualties. By the end of the Seven Days Battles, there was a total of 37,000 casualties between the two armies, 20,000 of ours, 17,000 of theirs. But we had pushed them off the peninsula. Richmond was now safe. The Army of Northern Virginia would go on to the rest of the year of 1862 to some very significant victories. At Second Manassas, we would defeat General Pope. And then at Sharpsburg, or you may know it as Antietam, we would meet General McClellan once again, and we would fight him to a draw. And he had twice as many men as we had. And then he was fired once again, and then we would meet General Burnside in Fredericksburg. Again, we would defeat the Federal Army. Three major victories and one draw in the battle of eight, in, in the year of 1862. And I firmly believe if things continue as they are, the Confederacy, before long, earn our independence. 1863, well, we'll see what happens in 1863, but 1862 was a very good year for the Army of North Virginia. Thank you. Eighteen sixty two was indeed a good year for the Confederacy in the Eastern Theater. In the Western Theater where I was, uh, things were going a little better for the North. First a word about strategy. You need to know about how the strategy changed throughout the war. Every year it changed a wee bit. When the war broke out in eighteen sixty one, everyone thought it was going to be a short affair. One battle ought to do it. Whoever wins the battle should win the war. But both sides, North and South, underestimated each other. They thought a quick victory, the other side would, would uh, pull back. But they forgot their adversary, their opponent, was an American. And what's wrong with Americans? We're stubborn people, we don't like to lose. The war would go on. Now, General Scott, who was in charge of the army early on, thought he, we could win the war actually bloodlessly. He called it the Anaconda Plan, like a giant snake surrounding the Confederacy that would constrict it. He said we would capture the Mississippi River and then all the the ports of the Confederacy would be blockaded and we'd snuff them out. He just forgot one thing. We didn't have enough ships <laughs> to do this. So the Anaconda Plan would not work in 1861. So when 1862 rolls around, President Lincoln changes the strategy again. He said the way we're going to win this war is we're going to move our armies into the south and capture the territory, bringing them back effectively into the Union. And so he ordered his generals to move. Now at the time, early 1862, I was a minor general. I was only a brigadier general in, uh, near Cairo, Illinois, in the very south part of uh, the state, right there on the confluence of the Mississippi and the Ohio rivers. He ordered all his generals to attack because his top generals all had excuses. Attack, he said. He said, and the other generals would say, well, we can't, President Lincoln. We don't have enough men. We don't have enough guns and enough horses. Bunch of whiners. So Lincoln, getting disgusted of this, he orders all the generals, even the minor ones, such as myself, to move. Well, I don't have to wait. 
from my commander to give me the orders. President Lincoln already did, so we're going to move. And I take my small army, put them on ships, and we go down the Ohio, and down the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers into the state of Tennessee, the northernmost state in the Confederacy in the Western Theater. Now the Confederates have blocked those rivers with, with big forts, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. So with the help of the Navy, we reduced Fort Henry rather easily and capture it. And Fort Donaldson is about 12 miles away down on the Cumberland River. So we decide to march eastward to, the, to uh, Fort Donaldson. Now, this is February. So what's the weather like in February in Tennessee? Pretty much anything. The day we started the march, it was 70 degrees and sunny. Now these soldiers are green, they don't know any better. They threw away their blankets. They threw away their overcoats. It was too much to carry. We get to Fort Donaldson, the temperature drops 40 degrees. Yeah, <laughs> it's sleet. In freezing rain, the soldiers learned a quick lesson about throwing away their overcoats. They froze that night. But the next day, we, be, we begin the battle to capture a whole Confederate army. And we surround their entrenchments. And they try to break out. And I say, are these men trying to beat us? Or are they trying to escape? So I ordered them ordered my soldiers to bring in me some prisoners. And I asked each of the prisoners to open their haversack, find out what's inside it. If it was ammunition, they're there to fight. If it was food, they're there to escape. Sure enough, it was filled with food. So I knew that they weren't there to fight us, they were there to run. So all I had to do was block their escape and push them back in their entrenchments and now they were surrounded. Their commanding officer didn't want to surrender. So he, as a coward, he leaves the army. He escapes out through the lines. Second in command said the same thing. I, I don't want to surrender, so he leaves. He said he left in charge a fellow named Simon Boulevard Buckner, a classmate of mine at West Point. They figured I'd give him good terms. Buckner asked for terms, and I said, I will, uh, I will not offer terms except on conditional surrender. I propose to move on your works immediately. He thought that was rather unchivalrous, but he surrendered anyway. Their entire Confederate Army, 13,500 men, in the 86 years of the United States Army, this was the largest surrender ever taken. Citizens of the North were just amazed. They were stunned. They were, they were excited. We finally won a victory. Who won this victory? This fellow named Grant. Nobody ever heard of me. So the newspapers in the North began posting pictures of me in, in their paper. The problem is, no pictures existed of me, so they took other generals, posted their face in the paper, and put my name on it. Yeah, how would you like if you did something fantastic and put somebody else's picture in the paper? Well, it worked out pretty good for me, because one of the pictures depicted a general holding a cigar like he was charging. Charge! Well, I don't smoke cigars, I've always been a pipe smoker. But after this picture makes the round in northern newspapers, grateful citizens began sending me free boxes of cigars. I'd get bag loads of them, and one time a whole train car load. So guess what? I'm smoking cigars now. <laughs> Mostly chew them though. So besides, the cigars, I got a new nickname. U.S. Grant stood for Unconditional Surrender. And believe me, that's a lot better nickname than the papers had been given me. Useless Grant and other things. And I received a promotion from a one-star Brigadier General to two-stars Major General. 
So I've now given a larger army, and we moved deeper and deeper into Tennessee. In fact, we were going to go clean through the state, get into Mississippi, and capture the railroad junction there at Corinth. Railroad junctions are very strategic points for moving men and material. So I'm accumulating a large army on the bank of the Tennessee River near a place called Pittsburgh Landing. I had about 40,000 men, but the Confederates realized I was getting more reinforcements, and they didn't wait for me to attack them. They had 46,000 men. They came after me on April 6th, Sunday morning. Oh yeah, they attacked me on a Sunday morning while my troops were cooking their breakfast and making their coffee. And they come screaming out of the woods, screaming like rebel yell to attack our troops. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever heard the rebel yell. Has anybody ever heard the rebel yell? We got one. Okay. You're all now going to hear the rebel yell because you're going to do it yourself. This is a do it yourself rebel yell. Here's how it works each Confederate soldier let out a high pitched yip. Yip, 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 yip. I want you all to do that, and you're going to hear what our men heard. Are you ready? Some of you weren't so yippiful, but uh, you got the point. And put a skier into our soldiers. And they overrun our lines. They captured our camps. I get on my horse and ride up and down the lines trying to reform the troops because they're pushing us back, pushing us back all day long. Our back is to the Tennessee River. We're going to get pushed into the river if we don't stop them. I find General Prentice and I said, see that wood lot with the sunken road? I want you to hold that at all costs. And he held it at all costs. Confederates attacked him all day long and were repulsed. Finally, they brought up 63 cannon and blasted him out. But he surrendered, but he bought us time because I was then able to go to the rear and form an, a line on the ridge with cannon to stop the Confederates. And by the end of the day, the afternoon, they saw that line and they quit. They said, we'll get them tomorrow. Well, that night on the battlefield was quite a storm, thunderstorm. I'm looking for a place to keep dry. So I find a, a house there in the battlefield and I walk inside only to find out it has been converted into a field hospital. What's wrong with that? There's blood everywhere. They're doing amputations and there's piles of limbs, arms and legs everywhere. And I say, I think I'd rather be out in the rainstorm than be with this. So I went up, I found a tree, opened up my cigar pouch and started puffing on a cigar when one of my generals, General William Sherman walks up to me and he says, well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day. I said, yep, lick him tomorrow. Lick him tomorrow? He and all my other generals figured I was going to order a retreat to safety to the other side of the river. No, no. Those Confederates are just as worn out disorganized, exhausted, and beat up as we are. If we hit them first light, we'll have the initiative. Besides, we've got reinforcements coming in tonight. And we're going to hit them tomorrow. That's what we did. We hit them first light, we got the initiative, and we pushed them back. Pushed them back. All day long the fighting took place. Until finally we threw them back in the woods where they started with that hideous rebel yell. Winning for the North, the Battle of Shiloh. Shiloh is named after a church on the battlefield. It means a place of peace. But this was far from a place of peace. You could not walk across the field without stepping on a wounded or a dead soldier. Pools of blood everywhere. Carnage like this country has never seen before. 23,000 men killed and wounded. That was more than our eight years in the American Revolutionary War, both sides. Two days. 
the war is changing again. Shiloh, although 23,000 casualties, turns out to be, that doesn't even make the top 10. Lee's battle that he talked about at the, at the uh, peninsula, there was 37,000 killed and wounded there. <coughs> Gettysburg, 51,000. Chickamauga, 38,000. The, the carnage would be tremendous. We did not, we no longer were fighting with gloves on. We took our gloves off and the war would go on and on and on. It changed the nature of the beast. Lincoln, in 63, issued the Emancipation Proclamation. That changed the nature of the war as well, allowing freed slaves to join the Union Army, which they did, 180,000 of them did. That changed the nature of the war. Battles began, but it was a bloody affair. And in 1864, Lincoln offered me command of the entire Union Army. He wanted to know what my strategy would be to win the war. I said, sir, the strategy hasn't been, been playing out so well. Although the Anaconda plan is starting to work now, now that we've got more ships. But capturing Confederate territory is slow and bloody business. What we need to do is to attack the Confederates on all points. Right now, where we attack them, they, they, they bolster it with the interior lines. And then when we attack here, they move over here. But if we attack them here, 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 and here, simultaneously, somewhere, somehow, they're going to crack. And when they do, we're going to go through that crack and rip, tear, destroy anything of military value, railroads, factories, warehouses, food supplies. We will destroy their means to fight this war. And at the same time, we will be destroying their will to fight this war. Confederates are, are they're very strong-willed and stubborn people. We need to break it. Lincoln says to me, well, that's, uh, that's awful strange, General Grant. He said, I said, well, we've got to work together. We've got to all work at the same time. And he said, well, that sounds to me like shearing sheep. <laughs> you, know, you know Lincoln and his stories. <laughs> shearing sheep, sir? He said, yes, General Grant, when you shear sheep, one man does the cutting, but everyone else involved is holding the leg. And that's what we did. We were always cutting or holding the leg for the next year of the war. And that, that strategy finally paid off to hit them everywhere, cut them, destroy their means, Sherman's march to the sea, destroy their will. It took about a year, but the strategy finally paid off. Mr. Mr. Lincoln is aware of all the evolution that happened in the war, including the strategy and our weaponry got better as well, as well, Mr. Lincoln. did, and that's what I intend well, to talk tell us about, about now. Thank you. Uh, I would first like to say that I feel it's a great irony that I became so involved in the development of some of the more deadly weapons involved in this war, because I'm someone who never liked to needlessly kill a living thing, could hardly stand the sight of blood, yet I've been overseeing this great slaughter of young men. When this war started, when the rebellion started, uh, we had Union soldiers that were still, that were, that were fighting with muskets that were used in the War of 1812. We began to rifle the muskets, but it, be, it seemed to me that we needed more modern weapons. And I knew that some of these more modern weapons existed and we needed to adopt them. But I was finding that there was a great deal of reluctance within the Army especially and also the Navy of adopting new ideas. And some of these ideas that I'm going to tell you about 
were not would not have been adopted I do not believe had I not pursued them and pushed them and encouraged them and in a few cases outright ordered that they be done uh, probably well first I want to talk about some things that weren't quite so deadly that we encouraged you know I had a fella from the Smithsonian come to me and and this is how I got some of my ideas that someone would come to me in government or they would know someone and someone in government would know someone with an idea they would bring it to me uh, perhaps they had uh, gone to someone in the army uh, and proposed this idea and got nowhere but someone thought it was a good idea so they would come and bring it to me personally there were also an occasion I'll tell you about later when young Chris Spencer had a, had a better rifle that he wanted to show. He actually just walked into my office in the White House one day carrying his rifle to show to me. Uh, anyway, uh, several, one of these ideas that came to me was a fellow from the Smithsonian brought a fellow who said, you know, you could put balloons up in the air and fill them with a hot gas. Now, this is not a small balloon, but a large balloon. You could attach an observation basket to this balloon and raise it up in the air. You could then run a telegraph wire from that basket down to the ground and it would allow you to see troop placements and movements at a great distance. So we tried that. We put one up one day as an observation balloon in the city of Washington and by golly we found out that you could see a range of 50 miles when you got that balloon up there. So you can imagine the advantage that could give us and within a year we had seven of these units in the Army uh, station. We even had one on a Navy ship that uh, was very useful to us. Uh, another idea that was presented to me that did not work out well was a fellow that came and said we could, he could predict the weather. And he said, you know, if, if we predict the weather, you know when it's going to rain, it would be easier to to plan your battles, you could save boys' lives, you could save money by, by not trying to fight when it was raining. So I said, well, we'd give it a try. And he said, it won't rain for the next, he gave me a range of five dates. It will not rain during these five days. Well, he came to see me the third day into that schedule, and it had been raining for 10 hours already <laughs> with no let up. He wanted to see me again. I said, I have no, no more time for the man. We gave up on that idea. Uh, but we got into more, shall we say, more effective weapon, weapons. Uh, we had to have better weapons. We had to be able to win battles. I became convinced later on, as, as General Grant alluded to, that the way to win this war was that it was not, we were not going to win the war by defeating the politicians in Richmond. We were going to win the war and reunite the country by defeating the Confederate Army. That is where its power is. It is power is in the military. And I felt that until we crushed that army and defeated their will to fight, we would not bring an end to this war. We would not bring an end to the rebellion. So we looked at more effective weapons. Now, as I say, one of, one of the uh, major impediments to progress was a fellow in the Ordnance Department of the Army, General, General Ripley. Uh, he did not like new ideas. He liked doing things his way. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm told uh, early on when he was a young officer, uh, General Jackson, uh, during some of our battles of, of our Revolutionary War had ordered some supplies. Uh, uh, Mr. Ripley was uh, an officer, and he was uh, in charge of the quartermaster corps, and uh, he would not issue the supplies to General Jackson because the requisition was not filled out properly and completely. Well, when General Jackson said he could issue those things right now, or he'd have them hung from the highest tree, he figured out how to fill out that requisition and issue the supplies. He, he moved so slowly that I am told behind his back his fellow uh, workers referred to him as Ripley Van Winkle. Uh, 
he felt that enough men had been killed with smoothbore musket and round ball uh, in the past, and that was as good enough as, as any weapon. And I said, but we have to have more accurate weapons. So as I say, we begin to rifle the weapons. Uh, but I began to po uh, uh, promote breech-loading weapons. They've been used out in the West for some years. And a, a breech-loading weapon, uh, the, for those of you not familiar with the gun, the back of the barrel is the breech, and you would, you would load the powder and the bullet from the back of the barrel rather than loading it from the muzzle. And, you know, as you're loading it from the muzzle, of course, the soldier is standing up and loading it. it he can do that laying down in a prone position, but it's not as easy. A breech loading, and, and the fellow with the, the muzzle loading rifle could do that in, in a, they tell me, about three times a minute if he's experienced at it. With a breech loading rifle, uh, it, you perhaps protect, particularly a sharps breech loader, you could fire eight to ten times a minute, and it had a, a range of about 500 yards, accurate range of about 500 yards. So it was much more effective and much better. I had two advantages for our soldiers. One, it was safer for them. They didn't have to stand up and be a target. And the other was, of course, it's, it's improved accuracy and range uh, and, and more rapid firing. <coughs> As a matter of fact, I am told at the Battle of Gettysburg, there was a unit uh, up on Little Round Top that was able to hold off Longstreet's charge. They had uh, Sharps breech-loading rifles. There were 100 men up on there, on Little Round Top, and the captured rebel soldiers in that battle thought that they were outnumbered perhaps five to one because the lead was flying so fast in that battle. And it was because, of course, these gentlemen had, these soldiers had the, uh, the breech-loading Sharps uh, that could fire much faster. It was a definite advantage. Well, we did get some of these breech loaders into the hands of the military, but it was only done when I went to General Ripley and issued him a direct order that they be purchased. Now, lots of these soldiers, of course, would have liked to have had the, the, uh, the sharks and some of the later weapons, but they just could not be produced fast enough. Uh, they were, they were a little more expensive, but they were a little more complicated uh, to produce, and you just couldn't make them fast enough to get them into the hands of everyone. So uh, many of the soldiers were still using the muzzle-loading rifles at, by the end of the war. Another weapon that we looked at, another improved rifle, uh, and here I go back to re reference to Chris Spencer, he brought in a rifle that he had developed. It was a breech loader, but it was a, it was a repeating rifle, and it had a tube that held seven shells, and the tube went into the butt of the gun. And it had a, if you can imagine, it had a lever on it. When you, when you fired, you moved this lever down, it ejected the spent shell and loaded a new shell. So a, a, a soldier could fire that rifle just as fast as he could eject the shell and put a new one in. Uh, if he had a couple extra tubes of those shells, he could fire maybe 21 times in a minute. And I think you can see the advantage of that. There was another advantage to the Sharps rifle, was that it used a, I'm sorry, the Spencer. It used a metal shell rather than the paper cartridge. So it was good in damp weather. Uh, some of the others, uh, if, if, you know, if the uh, powder got wet, got damp on the paper cartridges, it just wasn't going to fire. The disadvantage to these guns, which was one of the reasons that General Ripley didn't like them, was the, the uh, breech loaders used a different caliber uh, shell, different caliber bullet than the, uh, than the muskets. And that made it more difficult to get the proper ammunition to the soldiers. You know, it doesn't do any good to have your most modern weapon if you don't have the, the ammunition you need. And that was one of his reasons. But we, uh, the Spencer was another one of these weapons where the only reason that it was purchased was that I went and issued General Ripley a direct order that they be purchased. Uh, they were able to, they got them into the hands of some of the soldiers. You know, General Rosencrantz had wanted to set up a unit that moved kind of like uh, uh, 
Hunt's army did, at, where they would uh, travel as, as cavalry and dismount and fight as infantry. And uh, he authorized uh, someone, uh, Colonel uh, Wilder, to establish a unit of this. Colonel Wilder wanted to get Spencer's for his men, and Rosencrantz said he would get them for him, but Colonel Wilder just really didn't trust the government to move as fast as he wanted to move. He was a successful businessman uh, in Indiana. He apparently knew how to get things done because he went out and borrowed money, bought Spencer's himself, and issued them to his men with his men paying them back out of, out of their pay. And uh, there was one time where his men moved in, and I can't remember what battle it was, but they moved in and surrounded the Confederates, and they were just firing so fast, the Confederates thought they were outnumbered uh, by a great deal, and they surrendered. Uh, so these weapons were important. They were helpful. Uh, we just couldn't get enough of them out. General Ripley did have a good argument. You know, I, I was also, uh, uh, he had a good argument in providing the needed ammunition uh, and materials to the men. Uh, when we started the war, there were all sorts of cannon. Most of the cannon was a smooth bore, uh, muzzle-loading cannon, just as similar to what I've been talking about with, with the, with the uh, muskets and the rifles. We begin to rifle the cannon. The cannon, the rifle cannon, as most of you know, rifling puts a spiral inside the barrel, so when the projector comes out, it spins it. It gives it a greater accuracy and uh, a, a, a greater distance. And in the case of the cannon, it gives it more destructive power. When uh, Fort Pulaski was supposed to be taken in the Battle of Savannah, uh, the uh, fellow there in charge had been told that you know they were supposed to fire on Fort Pulaski. It had uh, walls, stone walls, seven and a half feet thick. And but uh, he had been told you know it was going to take a while using smooth bore cannon. It might take probably two months of firing for him to break through those walls of Fort Pulaski. Well, he was one of these fellows. Uh, I guess you say you can't do it. He'd like to figure out a way to do it anyway. He got rifled uh, parrot guns and put them on the other shore and began firing and within, I believe it was a couple of days, he had breached and just turned, turned the uh, fort into a pile of rubble. Uh, but General Ripley, as I say, did have a good point. A at the start of the war, there were, he had more than 600 different types of artillery shells and ammunition for cannon, artilleries, howitzers, uh, and all these various guns. Uh, and, and it was difficult for him to make sure, as I talked about the rifles, to, to make sure that they had the proper ammunition for, for the guns that were out there. Uh, and within a year or two, he had uh, decreased the number of available uh, artillery shells down to 140 from 600. That, that was an improvement. That was a good idea he had. We looked at some other things that were uh, rather unusual for the time. I remember one thing that we looked at. Somebody come, came and talked to me about something called Greek fire. Now, if you can kind of put your imagination to this, there, there was a canister of liquid that would be on the ground with a hand pump, and you would pump that up to create some pressure in it. And it had a hose with a nozzle on it, and when you shot this liquid out of the hose and put a fire to it, the flame to it, then that liquid would ignite. And anything that that liquid landed on, the liquid would continue to burn. So it was a, a tremendous advantage when you were moving into uh, wooden fortifications or facilities uh, to, to destroy that. But we did, uh, we found problems also, I did, in the Navy. It wasn't quite as bad in the Army as the Army as far as reluctance to adopt new technologies, but I began pushing early on for ironclad ships. Now, when the war started, England and France both had ironclad ships already, and even when I was a congressman during the Mexican War, I had proposed a bill to have a, uh, a trial uh, 
uh, of, of uh, an exhibition of protecting a ship with iron, but it didn't go anywhere. And uh, I suppose with the land battle of Mexico, everybody thought I was kind of silly. But it seemed to me not very bright that, you know, uh, that other navies were iron cladding their ships with iron and we weren't doing it. And folks in the Navy said, well, you know, if you put iron on a ship, it might sink. I said, well, they figured out how to do it in England and France. Besides, you know, any, any frontiersman out west can figure out how to build a flat boat to take down the river so it won't sink. Surely we can do that. I said, well, yeah, but then if, if it hits, gets hit and a projectile penetrates that ship, that, that cladding, it certainly will sink. I said, well, that's the whole idea behind the, the iron protection anyway, so a shell won't hit it and penetrate it. We finally begin to uh, ironclad our ships, and even the Confederates were, the Confederate Navy was, was uh, doing that. So those were some ideas, those were some things that we ran into. The uh, problems I had with just people not wanting to adopt new technology because the way we had done it and always been doing it was good enough, and why try anything new? Uh, but those, those are some of the things I was involved with, um, and uh, it, it did allow us to then eventually crush the will, and thanks to General Grant, crush the will of the Confederate armies to fight, where we hopefully will then be able to bring all this to an end. Thank you. According to my timepiece, we have some additional time in which we can open it up for questions. If you have a question for either General Lee, myself, or the President, or all three of us, you are welcome to do so at this point. Who will be first? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Mr. General Lee's comments. Can you just summarize what he said? General Lee's comments? I didn't hear it all. Right. What? what? Oh, a peninsula thing you said. Right. Uh, on June 1st of 1862, I assumed command of what had previously been known as the Army of the Potomac and renamed it the Army of Northern Virginia to give our boys their own sense of identity. Uh, previously, both armies were known as the Army of the Potomac, and when you had an achievement and it was in the newspapers, nobody knew who the victor was. This way, our boys had their own sense of identity, and when they had an achievement, everybody would know that the Army of Northern Virginia Pardon me? If I'm correct, you were a northern man. Yes. To begin with. We all were northern men originally. Why would you abandon the union? There were those that would call me a traitor because I turned down General Scott's um, offer to become the commanding general of the army and Francis uh, P. Blair's offer. Uh, what Mr. Lincoln had called for 75,000 volunteers. I myself did not consider myself a traitor because in 1829, when we graduated from West Point, we swore our allegiance to our native state, not to the United States. That was not a requirement until August 1st of 1861, nearly four months after the war had begun. I had lived my whole life by two maxims of duty and honor. How could I be an honorable man if I did not do my duty to Virginia? I took that oath at West Point as seriously as the oath that I gave to my wife Mary on the day I married her, that I would love her till the day I died, I would love Virginia till the day I died. If Virginia had decided to stay in the North, I would have fought for the North. But since they decided to go with the South, my fate was sealed with the South. I would not raise my sword against my home state, against my family and my friends and my neighbors. Any other questions? Who's your favorite cavalry general? Well, Jeb Stewart, without a doubt. I had known Jeb Stewart since I was a commandant at West Point. He was my son's best friend there. They were classmates. And he would come to our home every Sunday and have dinner with our family, and he would flirt with my daughters. And uh, he was a very flamboyant young man, but he was very good at what he did. He was a man that would never bring me any bad information. 
Uh, and when he was killed at uh, Yellow Tavern, it was, I literally cried like a baby. It was like losing my fourth son. But there was no one, in my opinion, that was better in the cavalry than him. One last comment from me. Your comments. You promise. <laughs> your comments about General Nathan Bedford Ford. Any general comments about that? I never met Nathan Bedford Ford. I did receive a, a slave from him that he offered to me uh, as a camp aide, and he took care of my horses. Um, but I had never met the man. I'm looking for some more questions. Very good. I understand that uh, Arlington, you had to give up Arlington. Uh, Arlington House? Part of the law. <clears throat> Arlington House was seized by the federal government for uh, non payment of taxes. Uh, the master of the house had to appear in person to pay the taxes. Well, they assumed that I was the master of the house. I never owned any property in my life. Arlington House was not my home. It was my wife's home. And when her father died, she was given permission to live the rest of her life there. But it was our oldest son, George Washington Custis Lee, who inherited the property. Now, he... Uh, after the war, he sued the federal government for illegal seizure of his property because they never notified him about paying the, the taxes. And he won it in court. And then he donated it to the National Military Cemeteries. Now, I had the house insured for $5,000 and the barn for $1,500 with the Hartford Insurance Company. And after the war, I submitted a claim against that insurance and I received payment for the home. Pardon me? You didn't have to give that property up because you lost the war. No, no, it was seized uh, um, uh, right at the beginning of the war. May I comment, too, that early on we were quite concerned that uh, the mansion over there at, at Arlington looked down over the city of Washington, and there was a concern that if artillery was put in place by the rebellion or rebellious army, it could shoot down on the city of Washington and just utterly destroy the city. Uh, so there was a great uh, uh, encouragement for us to take over that property. We ran out of national cemeteries. The war was, the casualties were enormous. So we were looking for a place to, to bury the dead. And I think it was your friend Montgomery Miggs Mon suggested. General Montgomery Miggs. Uh, former best friend of mine who was also an engineer and he was very instrumental in the design of the Capitol building. In fact, I, I believe he was the one who was in charge of uh, finishing the Capitol building. But he was the one that ordered that all the bodies be buried as close to the house as possible so that it could no longer be inhabited. I don't know how. I mean, uh, two sides could not get together. There, uh, there were early attempts, uh, even before I became president, uh, to uh, be, to discuss the issues. Uh, Jefferson Davis became president of his rebellion prior to my inauguration as president of the United States. Uh, and he did send a message to me that he would like to have people come and talk to me to discuss our differences. But I was not willing to do anything that would make it appear that I was recognizing those in rebellion as a legitimate government. And my soon-to-be cabinet cautioned me against meeting with anyone because it would look like we were surrendering before I even took office. Now, I ran an, an election and a campaign fairly, fairly representing my principles and then was told after I was elected that at least, unless I agreed with the people that I defeated, they would tear up the government. 
and I could I could not allow that it, until those in rebellion agree to reunite as one common country. That 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 is my requirement uh, to end this rebellion. It would have been my requirement uh, to keep it from happening that we maintain one common country and there did not seem to be that interest in the South. Well, if you have time, I'll ask one more question. Very good. I said that before, I know. But General Sherman remarked that Nathan Pepper Force, he called that devil. Oh, yes. He kept cutting your lines and supply lines. I just wondered if you had any comments about Nathan Pepper Force. I wish we would have captured him at Fort Donaldson, but he escaped from there. That would have put an end to that. He was probably the best example of a, of a he started out as a private and he worked his way up, up to a general. Probably the best example of a self-made man, one of, the, one of their top officers. He was a devil. Don, again, we thank you for your kind attention today. General Lee and I are over here, and President Lincoln is there if you'd like.